Coming up on Techzilla, we got a power supply buying guy with hard OCPs, Kyle Bennett. What to do when you just can't back up everything online? AC Nation's got a festival of projector questions. And hey, we got more viewer questions for you. So fluff your favorite pillow and tell the kids to pipe down, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Netflix. Go to netflix.com slash techzilla to get a free trial membership. Go to Assist Express. Support smarter with Go to Assist Express and Squarespace. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla. Hands on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best way to lose 50 pounds without getting all kinds of sick, we've got an answer for you. Well, at least he does. Yeah. <laughs> and if we don't, we'll drag down somebody who can answer your questions. Chrome users, you like quality search results? Do yourself a favor, download the new personal block list extension for Chrome. Every time you click block URL next to a sarcastic result, you'll never see that domain in your results again. Plus, that info will be sent to Google for them to analyze and possibly help them figure out how to avoid those crummy sites altogether. And of course, you can always edit those block sites if you decide later on that you really do want those great articles on how to boil water from eHow. I'm kidding. There actually, as far as I know, isn't a boiling water article on eHow. I think I found one or two things that have helped me out once in a while. Didn't they used to, on Google's page, have a little X next to the search results so you could click that if you didn't like it and it would just vanish? But I maybe think you were dreaming about that. I might be. Because it would be so nice. And, and now you can have it if you're running Chrome and you download that extension. Cool. And that is a Google extension? Google actually extension. Coded Google by tool. the guys themselves and the Coded gals? by the people who are tired of hearing people like me whining about content farms spamming up my search results. Cool. Hey, the weirdest rumor of the week does not involve Apple. Nope. Mm -hmm. It's the chatter online that Dell might be buying AMD. What? Yes. <laughs> Advanced micro devices. That AMD, the one that makes CPUs and GPUs. We're not sure if it was a slow news week. Uh, Bloomberg quotes at least one financial analyst that says, quote, it's a far-fetched possibility. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It was well. enough to drive AMD stock up a little bit, which That's makes me cool. wonder if it was somebody over lunch going, I know how we can make some money on stock. That, that is a mighty fine <laughs> graphics card chipset CPU manufacturing company. It'd I'd be just, weird if Dell bought them. Yeah. I don't know what to think about that, really. Meanwhile, a move that Gizmodo, amongst others, is calling, quote, flat out evil, unquote, Apple has launched subscriptions in the App Store. Doesn't sound evil. You can have your credit card charged every month for stuff inside the App Store, like newspapers or magazines, games. That's nice, right? Yeah, well, just like Facebook's recent move to monetize the game, Xenia, essentially, uh, Apple says they get 30% of the take of everything you subscribe to inside the iPhone. And hey, if a company has to match or beat any subscription deals, well, it's it, the company has to any any deal a company offers if, has if, if to be If you're running matched. a sale somewhere else besides that store in the Apple store, you're going to have to match that price, but Apple's going to still take that 30%. So on top of your sale. That's so a that's they, a nice chunk of change. Yeah, and good and the, percentage Apple. It's crazy, right? The rules are going to apply Well, they got it from Facebook. The rules are going to apply to video services like Netflix and Hulu, music services like Rhapsody and Radio. It might also impact companies like Amazon. You know, the Kindle app that my wife loves, forcing them to stop using website pop-ups or links to their web store and my beloved Netflix. Netflix.com slash Techzilla. <laughs> Apps have to comply by June 30th. They might get yanked from the App Store. Rhapsody is freaking out, firing up the attack lawyers. They said paying Apple's 30% fee instead of the normal 2.5% credit card fee makes the iPhone, quote, economically untenable. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens between now and June 30th. The walled garden gets a little tighter, and I just, I'm still in shock over the holiday figures for how many devices Apple sold. Apparently, Apple needs to keep the money flowing uh, big. And, and, and so. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and from our, uh, basically, and from the free our internets department, well, I'll just read the lead graph from Wired's Danger Room. Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton vowed on Tuesday to invest $25 million for developers to build tools that will let online dissidents around, uh, basically get around, quote, thugs, hackers, and censors. It's her attempt at giving teeth to the so-called internet freedom agenda that she unveiled last year. I'm just hoping the tech is made available here, too. Yeah. I, that, was, that was us, not Danger Room, saying, no, no. Like, hey, Hillary, we like the, you can send some of the tools to me and uh, Mr. Heron. I just want bulletproof internet. 
That should be it. it should be a part of our constitution. Yeah, well, I think Maybe it's good. There's, there's some stuff brewing in that neighborhood. <laughs> hey, and Ryan from Westminster, Maryland writes in. He says, I have decided to go completely digital on my media library. It took me around seven months to purge everything to digital or convert. I have a total of two terabytes of media. What would be a good backup solution? I would hate to lose uh, everything because of a hardware failure. You guys have mentioned about online backup, but Comcast caps my bandwidth at 250 gigabytes a month. I feel your pain. So it would, be, it would take a total of eight months to back it up via online and eight months to download it back to my hard drive. A complete, a complete total of 16 months. <laughs> oh, man, I feel your pain. Please help. Thank you. Signed, Ryan. Yeah, wow. that's eight months if you don't upload or download anything else. Oh. So I, it's it's kind of funny, right? You, you know, Veronica is moving from Mosey and testing a couple of options, and her okay. first one's taking like I think two and a half weeks now to upload 32 gigabytes of data, and, and she doesn't really have a slow connection in her that's house. That's just 32 gigs. Yeah, and it's like that's you, one Blu-ray movie. It's kind of funny. I never really thought about it before, but your cap is data usage, not downloads, total data usage, uploads and downloads. And that's been in place for Comcast since October 1st, 2008, before HD video became super commonplace. When they put the cap in place, you know, Comcast was this big thing like, you'd have to send 50 million plain text <laughs> emails to break the cap, or download 62,500 songs at four megabytes a song, or download 125 standard definition movies at two gigabytes a movie, or upload 25,000 high resolution digital photos at 10 megabytes a photo uh, to break the cap. And now that's like maybe 75 hours of HD video, uh, or, or maybe, you know. Or leave your torrent program running for a couple of days. That will, uh, with a popular file or two, that will, that, will, that will hose your cap for the month. And if you uh, have a couple... Speaking from personal experience. Teenagers in the house with oh, a minor Netflix edition roommates. or some Hulu action. Um, yeah, you know, the, the 250 gigabytes is like 1 16th of my personal media library on the server. So if you have a giant collection of data, um, hopefully it fits on a couple of 2 terabyte hard drives. And what you can do is swap hard drives with a friend or store them in a safe deposit box at the office, etc. And hey... He'll take it to his house in San Leandro, I'll take this to my house in Alameda, and hopefully there won't be a giant crack in the earth that swallows both his apartment building and, and, and the, the, the craftsman I live in. I think they call that a yellow or a red event. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that would, we have nothing like that going on. Yeah, the, it, you know, it, it, Richter scale nine in California does fall off into the ocean. No, but I, I've had a friend personally, a photography friend, right. uh, had, had his house burned down and lost everything right. except for what he had, had saved at his friend's houses. And that was the remainder of that content that he had left, and that was that was a tragic day. And it's like uh, if you can avoid that situation easily enough, yeah. And I think a hard drive is arguably one of the cheapest ways to do it. If you're talking about a lot of personal financial data, you know, uh, or your tax records, you know, the information about something naughty you did uh, for your memoirs, encrypt the information as it goes onto that hard drive. Definitely. <laughs> Got a question you want us to answer on the show? Shoot us an email at techzilla@revisions3.com or tweet us at techzilla. Uh, or at Robert Heron, or at Patrick Norton, or at Veronica. At Veronica. We want your questions. Hey, let's take one of our sponsors, Netflix. They deliver movies directly to your home. They deliver movies directly to my home and Weeds, which my wife has fallen absolutely in love with and jammed through two seasons in like three days, which is probably blowing through my cap, Comcast. As a Netflix Unlimited member, it's great. You get to watch thousands of TV episodes and movies Stream directly to your PC or my wife's Mac or to the Netflix-ready device attached to our television. Not an Xbox 360, although that works. Not a PS3, although that works. Not a Nintendo Wii console. No, we've got a Roku box and an Apple TV plugged into our HDTV at home. All of those will play the unbelievable Netflix video streams. And you can still get DVDs and Blu-rays by mail on a single business day. Watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want. Never any late fees, never any due dates. And if you haven't experienced the glory that is Netflix, as a TechZilla viewer, we can hook you up. A free trial membership. Go to Netflix.com slash TechZilla, sign up now, and please use Netflix.com slash TechZilla so they know we sent you and we get paid and we can keep bringing the show to you. Yeah. Want to get our AC Nation on? I would love to. The big news first, Criterion is adding their entire collection to Hulu Plus. Nice. Yes! We all, you've probably heard us wax 
long and long and long. Criterion has amazing, incredible restorations of classic films. They put together some amazingly extensive special features, and now they're bringing their archives to the web for anybody with a Hulu Plus subscription to enjoy. Nice. We're talking 150 films that will be available now, and they'll be rolling out the rest of their library, which totals about 800 films in the coming months. And yes, the special features will be available as well as many uh, which I ha which haven't been digitized before now. Uh, if you don't have a Hulu Plus subscription, they'll be also rotating these selected titles through the free service. However, free users will have an ad break or two while the Plus subscribers get to skip commercials. So. Finally, a good reason for my Plus account. I and if the encodes <laughs> look as good as the Criterion Collection's content is, Ooh. that that tempts me, tempts me to pay that monthly fee. Ready for a projector festival? Mm. I would mm. love, love well, my projectors. A while back, a viewer named Zach in Connecticut asked whether or not he should get Optoma's HD20 projector. Had some light issues. Joe writes in to say, please tell Zach in Connecticut to go for it. I've had the HD20. Thanks for the recommendation, Robert as our main TV for the last year in a room with a window, blinds of course, as our main TV for about nine months now. It is by far the best projector I have owned to date. It functions just fine in ambient light, including a three bulb ceiling fan right in front of it. Our daytime programming is mainly Sprouts and Playhouse Disney and it does really well. I would like to remind you that direct sunlight will affect even direct view LED LCD TVs. With the shades on the window, most non-noir movies are just fine during the day. Darker is always better, but for the news or daytime TV, this projector really rocks and when I work from home I love hooking my laptop up to it for an awesome 108 inch display. Plus Zach in Connecticut gets a lot less sun than we do in Miami. That's nice. I, I love learning about the experiences of our viewers, uh, what they have with gear that they're owning. I mean and all this talk of 1080p front projectors has me wanting to upgrade my old, old, old front projector more than ever. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an HDMI port on my old projector, and it really <laughs> kind of bit me the other week. And, oh, dear. Uh, anyway. There was an incident. It was pain. It was just pain. And we missed the, the sellout.woot.com $650 Optoma HD20. It's sitting in my local Costco. There's a whole stack of them right there. In for, San Leandro? Yeah, for Where? $800. I was eight, just you know, there. $899. When? It, you walk down the main TV aisle. That's right at the end. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, it is Patrick who writes, Hey, greetings, HD Nation. I just got a new house with a very large living room. I'm looking for a new TV in the 55-inch to 65-inch range with a budget between $1,300 and $1,500. That's pretty specific. Any suggestions? The room is not very bright, so a projector is a possibility, but LCD is preferred. Thanks. Signed, Patrick L. in Orlando, Florida. Florida is in the house today. Whew. Warm. Warmer <laughs> when it's not freezing. I got hailed on twice today already. Oh, I got a little rain on me today. Anyway. Speaking uh, of the Optoma <laughs> HD20. Seriously, pair, pair that HD20 with, uh, with a nice tensioned screen, a ceiling mount maybe, and some mm -hmm. speakers, and you would have a very nice 65-inch or 85-inch or larger display without or breaking your budget. if you're in Miami, budget. 108 inches. There you go. <laughs> and you do all that without breaking your budget. And just how big is the wall you're thinking of using? That's yeah. really what my question would be. Uh, for the price range you mentioned, that will get you approximately about a 55-inch LCD or maybe a 58 to 60-inch plasma if you shop around. Yeah. I'm really curious about Toshiba's new 55-inch. They have the 55WX800U. It's one of their new 1080p, 240Hz Cinema Series 3D LED TVs. It has a sub-$1,500 online price, and it includes built-in Wi-Fi and DLNA streaming. Nice. I I'm getting that one in for review. I want to check that out. They have, I think, a 46-inch version of that same panel. Also squeezing under the $1,500 mark is LG's Infinia 60PK750, part of their 750 series. It's a 60-inch 1080p plasma HD TV that's THX certified, nice. Wi-Fi ready, and I saw a similar version at my local Costco, mentioning my local subscription box retailer store type thing. Yeah, you can also check, um, actually what I found out recently is is uh, Amazon sells refurbished uni units oh. through Amazon. You can actually get some incredible deals on what would normally be, you know, $1,500 is a pretty low, it's 1500 bucks is not a lot of money for a 55 inch No, not really. And I was surprised that there were a couple of LCDs out there that hit it. Uh, I was expecting to be mostly plasmas at that price mm -hmm. range, but you know, there is at least one. That Toshiba price is excellent. I just, I'm, I'm like, it almost seems too good to be true. You're like, there must be something wrong. <laughs> ah, but I, you know what? Toshiba makes really good TVs. They've been really good at doing color right for a long time, and that's something I've always been really pleased with them. And this is just one of their newer sets that incorporates a lot of cool features, including streaming functionality for your various video services and the DLNA stuff that I mentioned. It's just one we should really take a good look at. The price. Just show them some love. Down. Hopefully. All right. Let's it's a crap product, though. It's, it's, we'll call it out. 
<laughs> and he will. <laughs> Let's hear from Ian who writes in, I recently brought a new entry level 1080p projector, Samsung's A600, and I've been displaying it directly onto a light post-it note yellow wall. Oh my. That must be interesting. Obviously I need to fix this, and I've been looking at buying screen glue, goo, screen goo. The goo! Goo. Goo for your wall rather than a normal pull-down screen so I can get an exact screen size and possibly frame the screen however I choose. What would you recommend is the big option? Thanks, Ian. Um, yes. Yeah, you, you, you could tack a sheet up on the wall temporarily. Totally. Just or, or a gallon of you know titanium dioxide white paint is also a ch inexpensive way of going at it too. Is it like um, five percent titanium dioxide? Or? I probably it's it's a very pure white, very bright white. <laughs> I'm not sure what the percentage is for that. But I have used uh, Goo Systems as the company's name. They have a screen goo product. They basically make different shades of. Basically, it's a, a highly reflective acrylic paint that's right. available in various shades of gray, depending on the needs of, say, the projector's output or the room design. Maybe you have a room with uh, an extra bright room, and maybe you prefer a little a grayer paint right. scheme. Or if you want more oh, blacks, you lean to the grays. Yeah. If you want a brighter image, you lean towards the whites. Now, as far as options for more traditional projector screens, uh, they're practically endless. You have fixed mount. You can do retractable attention screen that minimizes any kind of wrinkling. They've got a like a I want to say a 96 or 100 inch motorized retractable screen from Monoprice.com. It's like 300 bucks. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that'd be nice to just hang in this giant room. I just want, well, I'm curious if it's tensioned or how it's actually going to work. Because there's nothing worse than the reason he's always mentioning tension screen is so you don't have that classic curl to the edges like you did in yeah. high school. I have a portable screen that's really convenient, yeah. but after all the use I put through it, you can see that it's starting to get a little bit of a ripple to it, mm -hmm. and it would look better if it were nice and tensioned flat right. and basically uh, basically stretched a little bit is really what I'm saying. But regardless of which screen system you choose, uh, a black mask around the border of the screen will help improve the perceived contrast of the picture. And it can be useful if you have some distortions on the edge. Maybe mm -hmm. your projector is not the highest end one, and your, your lens system is causing maybe a little curve or some oddity, and it's just nice to be able to overshoot it. Yeah. And if you do it into black felt, which is pretty cheap at your local, cons you know, wherever you can pick up black felt at your local hardware your store or wherever. Craft supply shop. Craft supply shop. Store. That really will, will make <laughs> the picture jump a little bit more out of, right. regardless of what color paint you use or what colored screen you go with. It just helps, and, it's not, and it makes it look kind of more pro. More fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. And then you put the curtains up above it. Mm. Mm. Hey, it's everybody. Ryan Shrout over at PCPer.com. He was on the show to talk about Intel Sandy Bridge recall a couple weeks ago. He hit us up with a rear projector question. He says, hey, guys, I just recently replaced the bulb in my 1080p DLP. I've had it for about four years. First bulb replacement, in fact. However, after the change, I noticed the screen was significantly brighter, almost too bright to watch at night. Also, I've noticed noise in the picture after the replacement, likely because of the extremely bright image. What do you suggest I do? I heard that waiting for a while will let the bulb brightness die down some, but it's a couple of weeks in, and I am still pretty annoyed by the change. Thanks, Ryan Trout, PC Perspective. I'm telling you, those a new lamp module will make an old TV shine like new, especially with the DLP technology, because the DLP right. chip itself really doesn't wear out. It's just a little bit of micro mirror technology, and all it is doing is bouncing light. So that part really doesn't wear out, but the lamp module, as you've learned, does. <laughs> Now, it's a good time, I think, to really explore your TV's picture yeah. mode presets. Try try the movie or theater mode and see if that's easier on your eyes. Back away from the vivid <laughs> or demo mode. Oh, most definitely. <laughs> and the TV may also have an energy saving mode that will reduce the lamp output as well. Yeah. Now, the noise you're referring to is more difficult to determine without seeing it in person, but I have seen plenty of RPTVs, rear projection TV screens, that have a hot spot shimmering quality, usually in the middle, that is exaggerated with head movement. There's almost a... I mean like head movement of people on the just screen? As or, you move your head, you'll see the, the shimmering artifact just kind of, that's what's causing it. It's like there's little bits of crystal, say, in the material of the screen material. And just by that motion of your head, you're, you're just reflect, ref, reflecting the light around a little bit different. And, oh, it, interesting. and it causes that shimmering effect to be more noticeable. If you could hold your head perfectly still, <laughs> it probably will stop shimmering, but it's an awfully, it's not a very practical way to watch TV. And, <laughs> There's really no way to defeat that, and right. I'm assuming there's no problem with the, the display system itself, the chip or the color wheel or the other items that go into it. Well, that it, sounds like a screen artifact that I've seen quite common. Say for and example, I find it annoying too, by the way. If you managed to web wedge in a bulb that was too bright for the application, could it generate so much heat that it might damage the DLP and create artifacts? I, that's pretty thin, huh? Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Odds are you shop for the correct lamp module for your TV. So but accidents happen. That's sometimes, true. you know, or sometimes things. If you're going from two, say, 230 watts, typical bulb 
uh, lamp module right. output to say, I don't think they make them much brighter than that for right. RPTVs. So, I mean, because sometimes, sometimes you buy a box and, and what it says on the outside that, of the okay. box isn't what's inside <laughs> the box. You got the extra special <laughs> output. Uh, you know, it could. Are you smelling uh, maybe a plastic smell or a, uh, <laughs> is there smoke dribbling out? No, I think you're going to be okay, okay there. But definitely try the other picture modes. Try turning fine. down the brightness of that lamp module somehow. But that shimmering effect, I'm pretty sure, is, it is not indi indicative of uh, anything that's wrong with the TV itself. Blu-ray releases. Ooh, yes. Hey, now it's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of February 22nd, 2011. First up, Memento, 10th Anniversary Edition. This is Christopher Nolan's first major feature film before he brought us Dark Knight and Inception. It stars Guy Pearce as a guy with no short-term memory, and thus the film begins at the end of the story and works backwards. The audience is as clueless as the main character until the very end, which makes you rethink the entire story and begs to be rewatched. This film was released on Blu-ray in 2006 by Sony and is now being released by Lionsgate in a 1080p ABC codec in a 235 to 1 aspect ratio. And according to Blu-ray.com, this version, quote, represents a significant upgrade, unquote, from the first version. The first version was released when Blu-ray was very young and the picture quality has come a long way since then. The quote, image is noticeably sharper and better defined with wonderful levels of fine detail and contrast, unquote. Plus, while the only extra on the previous version was a director's commentary and a 25-minute Sundance spot, this release adds a few more featurettes to the list. Also released this week, Get Low. This 2009 film is loosely based on a true story and stars Robert Duvall as a hermit who decides to hold a funeral for himself before he dies. This film is presented on a single 50 gigabyte disc in an MPEG-4 AVC 1080p codec with a 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio and a DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 lossless soundtrack. Blu-ray.com gives both the movie itself and the video quality a perfect score, saying it's quote, a masterpiece transfer and a perfect example of how a more laid back, less is more sort of image can look downright fantastic on Blu-ray. Yeah. Sorry, Blu-ray.com gives both the movie itself and the video quality a perfect score, saying it's, quote, a masterpiece transfer and a perfect example of how a more laid back, less is more sort of image can look downright fantastic on Blu-ray. Extras include an audio commentary with the director, producer, and lead actors, a seven-minute featurette exploring the roots behind the real story the film is based on, a nine-minute Q&A with the cast and crew, and much more. And finally, released on Friday, February 25th, Megamind. Starring Will Ferrell, Megamind takes a different approach to the superhero genre and follows a supervillain after he's vanquished his nemesis. This mega double pack, quote unquote, includes both a Blu-ray and a DVD with the Blu-ray and an MPEG-4 ABC codec and a 235 to 1 aspect ratio, all on a 50 gigabyte disc. Blu-ray.com reports that the transfer, quote, unfortunately comes up short of perfection, unquote, and says, quote, while the majority of the image is strikingly handsome and colorful, things often run afoul when nasty bouts of shimmering, false color, jagged edges, and banding appear with regularity. They give the video quality a three and a half out of five, saying it's not a disaster, but these issues shouldn't be present in such a recent animated movie. The commentary is available as a regular audio track, or you can choose the animator's corner, which puts it in a picture-in-picture -picture track with the occasional behind-the-scenes segment. Other extras include a trivia track, one deleted scene, a 10-minute Meet the Cast featurette, a 13-minute How to Draw Megamind, and so much more. Other releases include 48 Hours, Alien vs. Ninja, All-Star Superman, La Bayadere, Birdemic, Shock and Terror, Due Date, Due Date Combo, Elsa's Legacy, The Born Free Story, Embodiment of Evil, the Criterion Collection's Fish Tank, Fooly Cooly, The Complete Collection, Ghost Month, The History Channel's How the Earth Was Made, Complete Season 2, Ice Road Truckers, The Complete Season 4, Jeff Beck, Rock and Roll Party, Honoring Les Paul, 2008's Kill Shot, The Last Unicorn, Lemmy, Les Miserables, The 25th Anniversary Concert, Luke and Lucy and the Texas Rangers, Maria Stuarda, Mezrine, Killer Instinct Part 1, Morabito, Guardian of the Spirit, Series Part 1, Nurse Jackie Season 2, Psych 9, The Criterion Collection's Senso, Siddhartha, Steg Larsen's Trilogy, The Criterion Collection's Sweet Smell of Success, Weed Season 6, and WWE 2010 Bragging Rights. Coming up, Kyle Bennett from Hard OCP talks to us about power supplies, but first, 
let's hear from one of our sponsors. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, GoToAssist Express. If you provide technical support to clients, colleagues, friends, or family, have you found an easy, cost-effective way without being there in person? The best way for me to provide technical support is to do it online with GoToAssist Express. GoToAssist Express lets you view and control another computer online so you can quickly resolve technical issues. I've been able to help friends learn how to use new software and fix family computer problems without being there in person. TechZilla viewers can try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit gotoassist.com slash techzilla. That's gotoassist.com slash techzilla for a free trial. Joining us now via Skype, Kyle Bennett from hardocp.com. Welcome back to TechZilla, Kyle. How's it going, Patrick? It's going good, man. You guys do a lot of power supply reviews, power supply. We're, I want to do kind of a power supply buyer's guide with you. And should we start, because a lot of people still don't buy into the concept that your PSU, your power supply unit, may be the most important thing inside your case. Why, why is the power supply so important? Well, you, you're absolutely right. It probably is the most important component inside your system. And it, it's probably also the most undervalued as well. But when you think about all that high dollar hardware that you put in there and that you're possibly running outside specification and uh, the power supply is the one thing that supplies all the, all the power for everything in that case. So crappy power supply tends to lend to uh, crappy power, which tends to lend to broken components and components that fail that you may not know why. Data so, corruption, you know, blue screens, you know, premature hardware failure. All that stuff that you may sit around and try to diagnose forever, and it may just be the power supply throwing throwing dirty power. So, so start you start off with a really good power supply, and then those are those are things that go away that you just don't tend to have to worry about. Well, let's talk about you know you know thousand watt, twelve hundred watt power supplies. Very glamorous. They sound kind of future proof, but the reality, if you're not running like three GPUs and a top of the line like Core i7 or a six core AMD processor, way too much power for most people, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, where we start considering, you know, 1,000 watt, one kilowatt power supplies is right about the 480 SLI level. So mm -hmm. dual, dual high end, 580, 480 GPUs. Then you're really talking about depending on the processor you're running, what exactly you've got in the system. You can you can easily pull 900 watts at the wall. That's that's a lot of juice. How about for a typical, let's say a Core i5, Core i7 machine, single GPU, maybe uh, an NVIDIA Ti, what, how many watts do you really need for something like that? Assuming I, would say, I would say most people are going to be safe there with a 500 watt, a good, a good quality 500 watt power supply. And what's, we should probably get real specific with this, what's the difference between a good quality 500 watt power supply and you know that that $45 100 500 watt power supply that came with the case uh, generally the two differences you're, you're really looking at between a quality power supply and, and one that's a not quality power supply is how clean the signal is mm -hmm. okay which is actually taking an oscilloscope out and, and looking at the signal right. and seeing how clean the signal is that, that it's actually bringing across and uh, the other big thing about that is voltage fluctuation. Um, so under different usage patterns, you'll see uh, voltage fluctuations on ATX power supplies on, on, on poor ones may fluctuate up to a, a full volt. That's a which, big deal on a five volt channel. <laughs> yeah, that is a real big deal. And that's way outside ATX spec as well. So those, those are really the two main things you're looking at. Our proper voltage regulation is probably the biggest issue you're talking about, mm -hmm. and then how clean, uh, how many milliamps the, the signal is actually fluctuating back and forth is the second. So how do you guys actually test power supplies over at Hard OCP? We use a Sun Moon 8800 uh, uh, ATX power supply tester, which is about a $5,000 piece of equipment, which yep. is made to specifically test ATX power supplies. So what we can do is take an ATX power supply and plug it into this and test every individual rail, every individual plug. We can load test on it. We can test. We can test. Uh, watch the voltage and the amperages across each channel, and it's just really, really specific piece of equipment. Outside that, you're looking at taking an oscilloscope and looking at things. And then we also do some testing that other people don't. We've actually built our own uh, transient load tester. So, um, say when you when you turn on your GPUs, right? You move from a 2D scenario to a 3D scenario. <laughs> up all this power all of a sudden. Right. That's a big thing in power supplies. 
how do, how do they handle that load all of a sudden it hits? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny. You don't really think about it, but, you know, the, the GPU fires up. If you have two or three hard drives, when you launch your system, like three exactly. hard drives spinning up, it's a huge amount of wattage compared to a hard drive once the once the platters are actually up to speed. Well, and, and another thing that you, that you see when you see like 80 plus and all these different efficiencies noted on these boxes, 80 plus test all their power supplies at 25 degrees C. Right. Okay. When we test our power supplies, we actually put them in an incubator inside a medical incubator <laughs> and heat them up to 45 degrees C, which which we, we have found people which have internal case temperatures of 45 C, even as far as 50 C. But so all the testing we do, that power supply is incubated at 45 degrees C as it would be in a hot case. So you'll see a lot of things react differently than they would at 25 C just saying leaving it out on an ambient uh, temperature test bench. What are your what are your sort of your your go-to yeah. power supply units at, at say like 500, 750 and 1000 watts? Is that a, would you say 500 would be the minimum anybody should be buying if they plan to to use this power supply for a few years? Yeah, single low end GPU stuff, you know, you're probably good with a 450 on a on a good power supply there too. Mhm. Mm um, but the fact of the matter is you can buy such good 500 watt power supplies now very fairly inexpensively. There's almost no reason to really look around and go cheaper with one. Okay. Not from an enthusiast standpoint where you can get five and seven year warranties on these products. So, you know, if you're buying a power supply now, you might look down the road and say, where, where am I going to be in my next three bills? Right. And go ahead and buy enough power for those. <laughs> and another thing that people don't understand is People think that when you sometimes you buy a thousand watt power supply, it's using a thousand watts all the time. Well, the power supply is only using as much power as it's needed to be pulled from it. So you can put a thousand watt power supply in there; mm -hmm. it may be only using two hundred watts. So which it's going to use the same amount of power as a, a five hundred watt power supply, <laughs> given the, given some efficiency differences there when it's uh, obviously changing from AC DC. But, but it should last you through, hey, I'm gonna use three NVIDIA TIs for all of my PCI Express slots, because it's two years from now and Crisis 3 is hitting the street. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So almost um, our, our go-to brands are, um, Intermax has always been a good one. Mm -hmm. Corsair has always been a good one. Mm -hmm. Silverstone, um, Seasonic, XFX, really good brand names. Um, none of those guys build their own power supplies. Oh, interesting. Okay, so, uh, well, I'll take that back. Intermax does, and Silverstone does build some of theirs as well, or most of theirs. Um, you'll find that Silverstone builds a lot of power supplies for a lot of these people. And a lot of these guys switch switch retailers all the time. Corsair may use this guy, and and uh, Seasonic may use this guy. Well, Seasonic builds some of their own, too. It's, it's really convoluted kind of industry. Um, but, you know, another guy, Antec, okay, A-N-T-E-C, -A -A Antec, the guys that you've, that have been go-to on power supply a long time. Mm -hmm. We just had a, we had a 900 watt power supply we re, we, blah, we reviewed from them last week that was a, was a bad piece of equipment. Ouch. So, I mean, it's like, even, even the, even some of the big guys can have a, can have a turd every once in a while. Do you think that's a possibility that it was just a, a you know, a, a, a Monday Friday build from the Antec? You know, is it possibly that it's a lemon, or do you think just the whole? Well, we went back and got another one. Uh huh. And it had the same problem. Ouch. So I don't know, and I mean these these were press samples, mm -hmm. so you know we saw and we honestly we still hadn't been able to figure out. We think it actually might be the ATX plug causing some of the problems. Oh wow. But but still it wouldn't carry the full load, so. You know, when you're, when you're going back and talking about the way we test, if it says 900 watts on the package, mm -hmm. we want it to be able to do 900 watts. Right. But, you know, you're a big car guy, man. You're a gearhead. <laughs> how, often, how often do you run full RPM, red line? Uh, every day when I commute, at least once. <laughs> how, long, how long do you keep it at red line? As little as possible. Exactly. <laughs> so it's kind of like the, it's, it's kind of the same solution with power supplies. We don't suggest that you take a power supply, a 900 watt power supply, and right. run it at 900 watts because they're just they're really not meant to do that. That's meant to be uh, some peak numbers on them. Sure. So if you're thinking about your wattage, we suggest that you use about 75 percent of the actual wattage for daily usage of peak usage. Mm -hmm. So you're just gonna you're gonna find you're gonna get a more reliable piece of equipment that lasts you longer. Kyle, awesome, awesome information as always. Great spiel on overclocking the TI came out recently. What's coming up on hardocp.com? Oh, big things this next week? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Go to hardocp.com the week after that. Kyle Bennett, the man who founded it, runs it, oversees the mayhem. Good testing, good information. I highly recommend it. Coming up next, are all micro USBs created equal? <laughs> Just try charging my modem with one. It ain't going to work. First, though, let's take a word from one of our sponsors. It's time to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace. Squarespace is an amazing tool. You want to host a blog, you want to have a website, personal portfolio, it doesn't matter, business, it doesn't matter if you can't code your way out of a paperback, Squarespace can give you the tools you need to create a high-end, complex website that is yours. It doesn't matter if it's two in the morning, you got a question, because every Squarespace user gets free 24-7 support. And hey, if you're sophisticated, you can code, Squarespace can take care of you there, and they've got great servers to host everything. It's basically an entire system for making your web all kinds of awesome. And Squarespace just pushed a brand new social widget for geolocation services, so if you want everybody on the web to know your most recent check-ins on Foursquare, Gowalla, and Facebook places on a live Google map. Squarespace has you covered. They're the only web publishing platform with a native built-in widget for displaying your check-in data. Totally customizable, fully integrated with Squarespace's style editor, which means you can make it work no problem. And Squarespace's iPhone app, you can publish to your blog on the go, moderate your comments, you can get push notifications to approve comments, you can mark comments as spam, reply to comments, and more, all from your iPhone so you can work the web anywhere you go. Look, many of the internet's most highly trafficked web pages powered by Squarespace, not to mention many of the personal pages of Revision 3's hosts and personalities. Do yourself a favor, if you're looking for a better website, go to squarespace.com slash techzilla. You'll get a two-week free trial and hey, you'll thank us when you're done. We want you to represent Techzilla in Revision 3. You don't need a graduate degree from an Ivy League school and family connections to be part of the Revision 3 ambassador campaign. Nope. If you want to help to announce new show launches, partner news and events, control the swag at meetups, you'll have the stickers and the t-shirts, people. How about frontline access to live shows and custom swag because you're an ambassador? And getting in the door at what our marketing maven calls one of the hottest companies in online TV? Then. Run! Don't walk to revision3.com slash street team right away. Seriously, you, you, some of you want jobs at Revision 3? This could be your in. Revision3.com slash street team. Nice. Hey, G in Australia emails. Hi, Techzilla crew. Micro USB is becoming a very popular port on phones these days. I've recently changed from a Nokia phone to a Samsung phone. Both of these phones use micro USB connections. Can I use the Nokia USB to micro USB cable for the Samsung? Uh, more importantly, I was wondering if the wall chargers with a micro USB plug at one end would work universally for all phones with micro USB ports. Signed, thank you. G in Australia. That's actually a great question. Short answer is, yeah, it should work just fine. The, the, the reality, though, is it kind of depends on the phone and the charger. If the micro USB charger that came with a Nokia or anything else is rated for, say, 750 milliamps to one amp or more, you should be good to go. Uh, the problem is when you have some older USB micro chargers that are rated for, like, 380 milliamps, those are going to undercharge your phone. won't hurt it. It'll just take forever to charge it out. It's really interesting, the micro USB charging spec that came out of the EU's demands that cell phone makers standardize on one charging port, they all kind of sighed and went, okay, we'll do micro USB. Um, for charging cables, what it does is, is the new phone standard that's going into effect, it jumps the data pins on the USB cable to supplement the 500 milliamp max that normally comes over the plus five volt pin on one of your micro USB 2.0 connectors, right? Pin one plus five volts USB, five units of 100 milliamps, 500 milliamps max, which isn't really enough for a lot of the more powerful phones. And it gets even weirder when you run into, you know, non-standard micro USB chargers like my Sprint Overdrive, which I think needs over an amp. It feels like it needs an amp and a half, or, or not, you know, like iPads don't charge off of a standard, not micro USB, but USB port. I could in know. any case, look, see if it's at least one amp on the charger. If it is, you're good to go. If not, it should still work. It'll just be very slow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, here's another email. Hi, Techzilla. I was watching the video, quote, scroll any news feed across your screen, unquote, and in minute 116, Minute one, 16 seconds in, I saw that the PC you were using had two antivirus softwares installed, uh, Microsoft Security Essentials, and the other, I think it's Pandas Cloud. Is that convenient? I thought that having two AV antivirus programs in the same computer could make a conflict of some kind. Thanks a lot, signed Ricardo. Oh boy. Well, you're right. 
Yes. There could be only one. <laughs> there should be only one. Yeah, that, that's our demo box that we load software onto for screen grabs and testing. One of those clients was disabled at the time, just not uninstalled yet. Please choose one and use one only. Keep it updated. <laughs> uh, another email from our beloved viewer. It says, hi guys, or hey guys, I love the show. Always like hearing your opinions on technology. I recently got two external IP addresses and I thought this would be a good time to teach myself how to make my own DNS servers. I've looked around on some of the how-tos, but, uh, but they were all either too vague or not what I'm looking for. To be more specific, I want to create my own DNS server for the internet so, so that I can make my own domains without having to go through services like GoDaddy. I currently have two Windows 2008 servers on two different IP addresses. Is there a way to do this? Thank you, Evan. I was reading that and I'm like, oh, it's such a cool, geeky learning project and a half. And, and the other part of me was like, you're kidding, right? Why do you go with OpenDNS? You'll suffer a lot less. Then I read it a second time and I realized you didn't want to host a DNS server. You wanted to create my own DNS servers for the internet so I can make domains, make my own domains without having to go through services like GoDaddy. Um, Internet 101, DNS or domain name system servers do not equal creating domain names. DNS is like a, a just think super phone book or lookup table that tells a computer what IP address to hit when a particular URL is typed into the browser bar. Domains are managed by the domain name registry, the network information center that manages the registration of domain names in top level domains like .com, .net, .org, usually with some tie to the government, though sometimes say, I want to say .us or .biz is a commercial organization. The registry here in the U.S. is ICANN. They only authorize a handful of companies to be domain registrars. That's like, you know, until 1999, there was just Network Solutions. Now there's a bunch. GoDaddy, Domain.com, Westhost, HostGator, Squarespace, whatever. You get the idea. You could become an accredited ICANN registrar if you can satisfy ICANN that you can do the job. And to do that, you need to pony up $2,500 non-refundable for the application fee to be submitted with the application where you basically prove that you have everything. They, they need you to prove that you can be a, a, a registrar. Res a responsible registrar. Right, right that, that, you can, <laughs> that you have the technical know-how and the financial backing and all your stuffs together. Then, if they actually approve your fee, you got to spend $4,000 every year for your accreditation, uh, basically when you're approved. Basically 2,500 non-refundable to apply. If you get accepted, it's 4,000 immediately and every year after. And then there's a variable quarterly fee that's billed based on you know, how many domain names you register. Um, the fee represents a portion of ICANN's operating costs, which I think are pegged at like 3.8 million a year. So you get a subset of 3.8 okay. million a year over the quarters. Um, Here's the thing, the, the amount varies, but my point is, no. <laughs> no, you can't just create domain names from scratch. I guess you probably could. I want to say that, but you, I want to say at least, I need to read that email again, but I think with like OpenDNS, you can create keywords right. that will just go to wherever you want them to be pointed to, and you can even do that within most routers themselves. Yeah, but he just, he just would, I, I like this idea, like yeah. a little DNS hacking is good for learning how the internet works. However, you don't get to be like, I want to own dancingweasels.com and build your own DNS server. Because if you piss off the people that control DNS, and DNS is controlled by a very small, very powerful, very serious group of individuals, they will just black hole your IP addresses and you, you, know, you will just never do anything again. Within your own like, non-network or non-internet yeah. connected network though, couldn't you just create like a host file? Why not? And just name it whatever you want. <laughs> I want to be Google.com and have that point to my, I don't know, media server in the living room. It's, I, yeah, well, it's, I, it's one thing to do. It's, it's if an you, interesting question. If you do it in your home network that is not connected to the internet or, or is kept away from the internet by a proxy, have a blast. But the, the reality is, is you don't Dine get Dine DNS? No. <laughs> I've just That's, I'm throwing it out there. Stop. Different. Don't even don't yeah. even bring dynamic <laughs> DNS into this. You'll confuse everyone. Look, you don't get to make up. You don't get to sell domain names. You don't get to make up a domain name and put it out on the internet. That Unless is, you got about sixty five hundred bucks. Yeah, and everything goes well. And 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 you you front really well with I can't. Yep. Yeah. Hey everybody, youtube.com slash techhd, facebook.com slash techzilla. We want your questions. Techzilla at revision3.com or at Veronica, at Robert Heron, at Patrick Norton, at Techzilla, at Serafina K, at Jolly Roger. At Jolly Roger. At Jolly Roger. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. We'll see you next week on Techzilla.
starring Will Ferrell. Is it Ferrell or Ferrell? Ferrell, sorry. <laughs> Saying it's not a disaster, but these issues shouldn't. Shush. <laughs> Shulla <laughs> should not. It's not a disaster, but these issues shouldn't be present in such a recent animated. <laughs> <laughs> I need to drink more. Mm.